Um, before I start, the first thing I'll do is answer a question by Ahmed here. So Ahmed asked, is this event going to be recorded for later? Um, the answer is yes and no. Um, the event will be recorded, yes. Um, so one or two sections may be edited, so it may not be the exact same stream, uh, the recording, you know, it may be edited slightly, but yes, it will be recorded and you can watch the session again uh, in, in the future. So if you're worried about dropping off early, you're fine, you can get a recording. Uh, don't, don't feel too worried about that. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. Um, there's questions about sound here. Yeah, you should be able to hear me. So if you can't hear me, refresh, check your volume and things like that. So let's get started. Uh, welcome to DevNation Day. We're focusing on GitOps and CICD. Um, I'm Evan Short as a developer advocate, and I'm just here to introduce our, uh, our awesome speakers. So on our agenda today, we're going to have Harriet and Gustav from Red Hat. They're going to talk about uh, Tecton and Argo with a community update. We have um, City here to talk about their uh, fortified DevOps factory. Ford will be talking about OpenShift lifecycle management using Tecton, Argo, and Pack. And then lessons learned from Olena, Sal, and Ian on using um, GitOps and OpenShift. We have AWS talking about Argo CD scalability and testing. And then finally, we'll have a Q&A at the end. Um, so that's the overall agenda. We're going to be here for a little bit. I hope you stick with us. Do not hesitate to use the chat. Um, there's a few of us backstage. We can answer questions. And we're also going to be able to answer your questions live as well. Um, so I think, yeah, let's get started. I'll hand over to Harriet and Gustav for their community update. Thanks so much, Evan. All right, I think we'll get started with Gustav talking about Tecton. Yep. Uh, hi, everyone. So I think uh, to, to start with, to give a brief intro about Tecton itself, uh, it's an open source project. Uh, which provides a comprehensive set of standardized components uh, tailored for building Kubernetes-style CI/CD system. Uh, so currently, uh, it, it is governed by the CD Foundation. However, one community update from Tecton is that we are trying to move Tecton to CNCF uh, to gain even more momentum and amplify go-to-market activities. Uh, now, to see how Tecton shines within the OpenShift ecosystem, in OpenShift, we offer a supported and tested Tecton operator, and it does not stop there. We enhance Tecton with additional capabilities like uh, seamless integration with, with Dev Console, et cetera. So how OpenShift uh, pipelines are Tecton users and their use cases to talk about that. So it caters to primarily three, three kind of users. One is your platform engineers or site reliability engineering team who actually, for example, manages the Tecton config or let's say the controller resources, all sorts of things and then presents that to, to as a service to the end developer, which is your application engineering team and the release engineering team. So one important thing to note here is that the platform engineers, they provide a lot of tools as part of their internal developer platform. And we will hear about it uh, when we hear from City, Ford, uh, and other uh, uh, speakers uh, that they are providing Tecton as a service to their end developers. And there will be a lot of tools along with Tecton. Uh, there can be CD tools, there can be sports scanning tools, and all sorts of things. Now, once Tecton is served to the application engineering or the release engineering, uh, the release engineering, what it does is basically, it obviously, uh, for example, prepares the application engineering team's pipelines. Uh, obviously, sometimes what happens, the platform engineering team provides some golden pipelines or golden tasks, which are the building blocks of Tecton, uh, to the release engineering or the application engineering team. Now, the whole point is basically the end users of the application engineering or the release engineering, their use cases becomes very broad. Uh, and obviously, it includes CI. Uh, CI is obviously the topmost use case that we are seeing with Tecton. But apart from that, there is obviously batch processing. There is uh, orchestration of a different kind of automation tools or any kind of tools in that nature. Uh, for example, you will hear about uh, 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 for example, from Ford itself, how they are using Tecton to orchestrate uh, with, with Terraform. And then uh, there is obviously custom business automation that, that obviously you can, can do uh, with, with Tecton itself. Now, uh, help, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so what's the value of Tecton in their whole internal developer platform? Right? And why, why should they use another tool with, with Tecton? 
So there are a couple of reasons behind that, as we see, and these are the things that we are hearing from, from the customers itself. So one is uh, obviously the hybrid model and cloud and vendor independence. You can, you can take a Tekton YAML file and you can run it in any cluster in any cloud. So that's one of the biggest value propositions. Other thing is that uh, when I when I when I talk about and I'll talk about the Tekton Core model, you'll understand that Tekton is a very flexible uh, in terms of integrating with other tools uh, because it is a very much Kubernetes native in nature. Uh, fundamentally, all your building blocks, the task, those are pods itself, and there you are writing, uh, for example, how the how the task will behave. Because of that, it has a tremendous flexibility to integrate with any suit tools of their choice. Now. Because the internal developer platform that the platform is going to provide, there are a lot of tools that the developers prefer. Uh, so that's why you need probably uh, some some sort of tool in CI which integrate with other tools much better. Uh, the other thing is obviously uh, to adopt advanced use cases, and we'll see that when our when our customers speak about it. Finally, obviously because uh, the Tekton itself is is Kubernetes in nature, all the tasks etc those runs as pods, you have your Tekton Kubernetes controller, which can scale pretty much well. Uh, so scalability and modularity is another value that the customers see uh, to pro include Tekton in their uh, uh, internal development platform. And finally, with Kubernetes, RBAC itself, uh, you will see that it is very easy to include uh, security in, in Tekton. And finally, Tekton has certain components specifically uh, tailored for the, for, for, keeping the whole DevSecOps narrative in place. One is obviously all sorts of scanning tools, all sorts of tools inside the Tekton hub itself. And the other thing is, is Tekton chains, which I'll talk in a, in a later. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so fundamentally, if you see the Tekton core model, right? So what happens in Tekton, it's, it's very simple to understand. So basically you have your source code management system, you have something uh, in, in GitHub, GitLab, or Bitbucket, or anywhere. For it can be some custom event as well. So the, there is a con component called Tekton Event Listener, which actually listens to those events, and then it can do additional events with filtering on those, and then pass it to the Tekton triggers. Now Tekton triggers will pass those payloads from the event, and then uh, pass it as a parameter to the to the pipeline itself. Now the whole pipeline itself is, is obviously will be a building blocks of, as I mentioned before, tasks. Uh, and that task can run parallelly sequentially. You can define all sorts of conditional things on, on the task. And inside task, there will be obviously steps. Now, for because each task itself run as a pod, right? Uh, there you can, there, there, this is the flexibility that I was talking about. For example, if you want to, uh, run a different image for each task you can do it if you want to uh, mount some volume or workspaces in any task uh, as 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 a true kubernetes way uh, that you can do it and obviously there are for example as an input to the task there are parameters and then you you consume the parameters and then from a task itself you emit some results and those results can be taken by another task as as a parameter so, uh, so that's the, that's the whole Tekton core model. There is event listener, there is trigger, and then there is pipeline. Uh, in the obviously the reusability part of of Tekton itself, the task can be reusable in nature. So there is Tekton hub, which is basically a collection of all the tasks. Uh, Harriet, uh, next slide. Yeah. So ultimately, if you see where where uh, Tekton is right now. So the customization, it is in the second quadrant, which means that the customization scope with Tekton is pretty high, right? But there is also, for example, the integration effort uh, to, to make it work with, obviously it can integrate with everything, but the effort that has to make it to integrate. Uh, so that's why Tekton, the effort is, is a little bit higher. So the direction of the whole Tekton community itself is to make it go to the first quadrant, where it will, it will increase the customization scope and then obviously it will make the integration effort much lower and that's where the whole community itself is moving and that's where also red hat is also moving with with tekton now uh, what i'll do is that I'll, I'll talk about some of the new things that tekton has as for example introduced and some of the uh, i mean basically some of the new things that is coming on that so one one is tekton dissolver so i, I talked about something around, for example, platform engineering teams providing some sort of golden pipeline or golden task to the internal, so the end users, right? Uh, 
that's where the tecton dissolver comes into into picture so that it makes the reusability aspect much more better uh, so for example if there is a golden pipeline on a golden task or etc that the platform engineers make it available to the end users and that can be via anything that can be for example those tasks or those pipelines can be inside a git repo if they want they can place it inside some sort of uh, namespacing in a cluster or let's say if they want to go beyond and uh, want to have that as as oci images as tecton bundles or maybe as 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 a task or pipeline in tecton hub or artifact hub. the resolver itself it will fetch those tasks and uh, in in the user pipeline run and it will resolute that and it will make easier for for the usability part so another so this is something that tecton recently launched and some some upcoming enhancements that we are seeing on tecton resolvers is obviously multi auth support etc but one important thing i would like to highlight is the caching support in the resolver that uh, that is something the community is working towards uh, the next part which uh, I, I want to talk about which is pipeline as code again this is an upstream project which which is built on top of tecton uh, and it is available as part of OpenShift pipelines uh, now pipeline as code this is this has been recently introduced and we are seeing a lot of customer adoption here uh, the beauty of it is that while i while i explained the tecton core model itself so there is event listener there is trigger right and then there's pipeline run. Uh, but setting up all of that uh, there is there can be a little bit of pain and that's why i told that the tecton is moving towards for example making the integration effort a little bit uh, lower the pipeline as code what it does is that it provides out of the box solution to integrate with, for example, your uh, STM providers can be with Git, Bitbucket, or anything. Via for GitHub, it is it is with GitHub applications. Uh, for other Git, GitLab or Bitbucket, it can be via the webhook. So once you set up the GitHub app with a particular repo uh, and your pipeline pipeline as a code controller uh, starts up. Uh, it's very easy so for example in your pipeline you don't have to write all those trigger templates you don't have to write all those event listeners uh, inside the pipeline as code inside the pipeline run yaml itself as an annotation you can add so for example at which event you want to trigger a particular pipeline it will, will it be a full request or a merge request or for example if let's say if you want to do some advanced cl based kind of filtering on those uh, uh, events that that also you can do uh, furthermore, as an annotation itself in the pipeline run YAML, you can add concurrency. So let's say you can, you can define that how many concurrent pipeline runs you want to run for that particular GitHub or GitLab repository. And also uh, how many pipeline runs you want to keep inside the cluster once, let's say the PR is, is, is complete or something like that. And then uh, ultimately after the annotations, it will be the same, same kind of pipeline run uh, YAMLs. Uh, one of the couple of enhancements, obviously, as we see uh, it growing adoption is around the uh, PAC interceptor. Uh, what it essentially means is that right now you see that whole pipeline as code, it, it stays inside a Git repo. So inside your source code management repo, the, inside the dot tecton file, you will have the pipeline run YAML. Uh, but you don't have to keep, for example, the task run or or even the pipeline YAMLs there. So you can, you can place it in a separate repo. You can provide it as a golden uh, template. And what PAT Interceptor does is it not only dissolves those pipeline runs, it can also do some additional operations. For example, you want uh, your CI pipeline or any pipeline uh, to happen. And then after that, there should be some kind of scanning task or some kind of uh, Change stuff that 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 happens. So you you can include that in the pipeline as code interceptor. Apart from that, there can be obviously other enhancements that we have that the community itself is planning, including multiple GitHub app support, etc. One two important things that I want to highlight here. One is, as I mentioned before, pipeline as code itself supports some sort of concurrency via the annotations. There will be much more advanced concurrency control that the community is planning. And the other thing is that. Uh, you will hear that many of our customers they use multiple clusters with Tecton. Uh, so we we want to have some sort of multi-cluster load balancing with with pipeline as code. Uh, the next item is is around Tecton results, and those who know Tecton is basically they know that observability is itself is a big pinpoint in in Tecton itself. Uh, 
Now, we, we, what, we, what I mean by that is that, for example, to access the logs, et cetera, your pipeline runs CR, et cetera, those needs to be there inside the cluster. That itself is, is not viable or not, in, in fact, that is not uh, scalable in nature at all. So that's why Tekton Results comes into the picture. So what Tekton Results essentially does is that uh, it's a separate component of Tekton, which uh, you can deploy, and then it, it watches the pipeline controller. It looks at whether a pipeline run is complete or not. If a pipeline run is complete, then you can configure the Tekton result to send the logs, the event logs, uh, to, to a separate place, to a logging infrastructure that you might have. For example, right now, uh, Tekton result support GCS S3, so sending the logs there. And then, obviously, you can. There is a Postgres DB that comes with Tekton results, and obviously, you can bring your own external Postgres DB as well. Uh, you can query from that Postgres DB all your logs, all your pipeline run records, and everything. Uh, so there are. This is an, one important uh, aspect that we believe that that will solve a lot of problem with Tekton observability itself. A uh, couple of enhancements on the Tekton results will be a much better for namespace logging infrastructure. We know that. Uh, customers do provide namespace as a service to, to their end developers. There will be some sort of enhancements on the log retention policies, etc. And finally, from OpenShift itself, uh, we will integrate Tekton results with, the, with our console itself so that even the older pipeline run logs, everything, you can view it in a nice uh, dashboard. And there will be some sort of metrics view on top of that. Next. Uh, and I'll quickly cover this is, is obviously there is Tekton chains. Uh, it has been uh, there in the community, but gradually we are seeing a lot of adoption in Tekton chains. Uh, and this is where another benefit of Tekton comes into the picture. So it, it is the supply chain security manager for Tekton. Uh, what it essentially does is that it can create your signed provenance for your Tekton builds. Uh, not only that, so it observes, for example, all your tasks and executions or pipeline run executions. And then, for example, it converts those snapshots in a payload and then uh, signs those uh, payloads. Uh, there are a lot of in, uh, enhancements that is that is going on on Tekton chains as we gradually see that customers starting to adopt it. Next. Uh, finally, I think I'll quickly cover the pipeline core update itself. Uh, in the community, there is now V1 API, uh, obviously, and then there is custom task which has been included in in uh, in pipeline. And this custom task is a is a very powerful feature in that uh, regard. So, for example, all your different kind of things like your manual approval, those sort of things you can do by a custom task. Uh, isolated workspace has been there in Tekton for some time. The recently what has been introduced is called pipelines and in pipelines. So, for example, if you want to chain two pipelines in Tekton, previously this feature was not there. So, this is something uh, that has been introduced in, in the Tekton pipeline itself. Uh, pipelines in pipelines, it it, it helps better in, in the orchestrating part itself. And finally, this is something that Red Hat itself is doing, which is called Tekton Ecosystem. Now, as I always mention, that we want to make the integration effort itself is lower. Even though there is Tekton Catalog, now we want to have much more better collection of tasks or pipeline inside from, and, and that which will be supported by Red Hat and their partners. So we will be launching the Red Hat Tekton Ecosystem soon. Uh, so and uh, let's say, yeah, fundamentally, if you see all those uh, from Tekton resolvers to Tekton uh, uh, results to pipeline and score, all of them, they are trying to do what they're trying to do is to make the customization scope high and the integration effort is lower. And Tekton will be uh, moving there. Uh, and that's where, thank you. That's it. Over to you, Harriet. And I need a microphone on as well. Thank you so much, Gustav. All right, so um, at Red Hat, we focus on Argo CD as our GitOps engine and our recommended application and configuration deployment tool. Um, but I'm guessing not all of you here today are that familiar with GitOps. Um, so if this is the first that you're hearing of it, uh, GitOps has come out of DevOps. It's a kind of an evolution there. It takes the DevOps lifecycle and it ties it into Git and it adds in continuous reconciliation. So it's mostly focused on the continuous deployment and delivery part of the DevOps lifecycle, but GitOps also brings in elements of continuous monitoring and infrastructure as code, 
uh, as well as the cultural aspects of collaboration and communication. So there are these four Git, like core GitOps principles, um, and these were defined by the GitOps working group in 2021. Uh, so the first one is that your system is described declaratively. It means you've written down somewhere, usually in YAML, what your system should look like, be that an application with access control or how a cluster should be configured. Next, we want this desired state to be versioned and immutable. Um, we need our YAML files to be stored centrally and accessibly. Um, and that will create a single source of truth for our system. Um, so this usually comes about by using Git, but any system that complies with this principle can be used. Uh, next up, we want any changes that we approve to then be applied automatically. Uh, so usually that approval process is through a pull request to your config repo. And then once that merges, we want those changes to be rolled out automatically. So not only does it pull from Git, but it pulls at regular intervals to check for changes. Uh, which leads us into the last one, which I feel is the real key part of GitOps. Um, so you've got a controller that monitors your repo and it polls for changes, uh, detects drift between your desired state and the actual state of your system, and it can act on that drift. So that might be notifying you of the discrepancy or it could be automatically bringing it back into sync. So there are a lot of reasons why an organization or a team might look into GitOps for a new approach. Some of the challenges that we hear frequently from our customers are um, changes to your config is making it hard for your QE teams and developers to do their jobs. Um, perhaps you're spending a heap of engineering time on deployment. Maybe you need a way to create an audit trail for your configuration. Um, though even in less strictly regulated environments, change management by itself can be difficult. Maybe you're currently managing config by hand on each cluster. Maybe the history of why things are done the way that they are is stored only in the heads of your long-term staff. And then when you go and try to implement automation, it's hard to do that without a supporting framework. So many of our OpenShift customers have faced these challenges and have found GitOps to be a good way to address them. Um, so if you're new to GitOps on OpenShift, we have an operator available that will set you up for success. So that's the OpenShift GitOps operator, and that's available on Operator Hub, and it's managed by OLM. So when you install it, the operator will set you up with an instance of Argo CD with cluster-wide permissions, and then you can go and install as many more instances as you need, wherever you need them. So what's coming next? Um, so obviously our upstream is Argo CD, um, and that comes into OpenShift GitOps uh, shortly afterwards. So there's a lot on the horizon um, that is very exciting, um, and I've just picked out a couple of highlights. So the 2.9 release is coming very soon and has a lot of awesome features. Um, we'll be getting support for rollbacks and history in multi-source applications. Uh, the Azure DevOps webhooks will be part of the Git generator. Um, a new feature that allows you to um, instead of having to set up manual resource exclusions, um, when you have insufficient RBAC permissions for something, it will set that up automatically for you. Um, we're also getting self-signed TLS certificates for the GitLab provider um, and a heap more things. Um, Helm lookups. So this is a really popular request um, from all of our customers and the community. Um, but it is a really tricky one, as how Helm works with Argo CD is really baked into the design. Um, it is early days yet, but there is a very exciting POC in process from one of the Code Fresh founders, Dan. And it utilizes the new feature that was released as part of Helm 313 that allows dry run to perform lookups. So keep your eyes peeled for that one. Uh, source verification policies. So this is a new proposal in the upstream community by our own GitOps architect at Red Hat, Jan Fischer. And these provide the ability to define how strictly and how far back you need to verify commits in a repo. So it'll start just by using GPG, which is already supported in Argo, um, but we are looking to expand it um, into include things like SigStore and Helm provenance as well. Uh, the last one I've put on here is the scalability SIG. Um, so you'll be hearing from our friends at AWS today, uh, who are some of the main drivers in the scalability special interest group in the upstream community. This group has been incredible and done some really awesome work so far. It's making fantastic progress at kind of testing the limits of Argo CD's scaling capabilities. 
um, finding the root causes and going after them and fixing them. All right, we've got two big events coming up very soon. Um, there's ArgoCon NA and GitOpsCon EU. Uh, so ArgoCon is co-located with KubeCon again, and it will be in Chicago on the 6th of November. Um, and if you're not able to make it there, the talks will be posted online as usual by the CNCF after the event concludes. Um, GitOpsCon EU is a virtual event this year, and it's going to be happening on the 5th and 6th of December. Uh, the schedule will be announced soon, so keep your eyes out for that. Um, I was lucky enough to be chosen for the program committee for both these events, and I can tell you that the agendas are going to be jam-packed with awesome sessions. Uh, if you're looking for more information about GitOps in general, Argo CD or OpenShift GitOps in particular, there is a bunch of stuff out there, and I will drop the links to all of these in the chat so that you can take a look at them. And that is me. So I'll hand back to Evan. Thanks, Harriet. So up next, we have Jason from City, I believe, to talk. Um, excuse me, to talk about their um, Fortify DevOps factory. So I think it's uh, time to introduce Jason. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Hey, Jason. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Am I? Am I on? Yes, you are indeed. I am indeed. Brilliant. Okay, good. Um, uh, yeah, apologies, everybody. The, uh, this is the first time using this platform. There seems to be a little bit of a lag on my camera at times. So if I seem to be saying one thing, but looking like I'm saying something else, then uh, uh, well, you know, I might I might drop the, the background if that happens. But uh, let's see how we go. Uh, so my name is Jason Morris. I am the head of DevOps enablement at uh, City for our, what we call our institutional clients group. Um, and um, yeah, I, I'm uh, I'm a developer by uh, by trade. I've uh, you know been, was doing development for sort of 20, 25 years. Um, I primarily working in the electronic trading space, so uh, you know a lot of um, uh, you know high frequency stuff in uh, the, the city trading space. Um, and uh, but more recently, have sort of gravitated towards DevOps. Um, I mean, I've been doing this role now for about five. Five and a half years and um you know i found that i was maybe more attracted to the process of delivering software and you know how we do that and at high quality and high frequency um yeah, maybe more than i was about actually just uh, you know de delivering the uh, specific uh, business logic that i was and so that's what i do now um i was going to be joined today by my colleague sigal duek um she was she's my um sort of core engineering lead um unfortunately sigal is based out in, in tel aviv out in israel i'm sure you'll understand that um you know logistically that's been difficult to do so you're stuck with me and i am going to be flying solo for uh the next uh, sort of 15 20 minutes um right now i am supposed to be sharing some slides i apologize let me just put those up for harriet brilliant here we go all right uh, yeah, so that's me and Sigal. Um, so let's get started. Um, so, uh, you know, City, I hope, is a very well recognized uh, name, maybe more so in certain parts of the world than others. Um, but, you know, we, it is a truly global bank. Um, those of you who do know it, probably very familiar with Citibank. Certainly, if you're in the US, um, you know, we have a very, very big presence there. A lot of people just use that for their day to day banking. Um, that is only really half of our business. Um, you know, the retail side, we also have a massive uh, sort of institutional clients group of which I'm part. Um, you know, we are the bankers to governments to multinational corporations, pension funds, hedge funds, you know, all the very big players. And, you know, in some ways, I guess that's where we like to think the real money is. Um, you know, in terms of size, your know, city is huge. It is around 270,000 people globally, um, about 50,000 of those work in technology. We're a very, very big technology shop. Um, you know, my job is to try and enable those 50,000 people to deliver software um, you know, safely, securely, and swiftly. Um, and the people who are using it, you know, it, they're at varying levels on the CICD DevOps journey, um, which is important. And we can talk a little bit more about that as we go. Um, we also have a huge diversity of technologies, right? You know, pretty much in anything that's been a, uh, a fad in the last 40 years, We've got it right. We've got we go everything from, literally from mainframes to AI. We've got Java. We've got Python. We've got Go. We've got Node. We've got Scala. We've got Clojure. We've got F Sharp. We've got you name it. We've got it. 
and we do, and we also got you know just as a varied a uh, set of targets uh, servers as well. You know, we're delivering to physical VMs. We're a very big consumer of OpenShift. Um, and we use that as our internal um, Kubernetes platform. Um, we're increasingly moving to cloud. Obviously, mobile. We're on Linux. We're on Windows. Like I said, you know, you name it, we've got it. And um, you know, so part of my job there is to try and make sense of all of that. Um, so in terms of my own operation, I you know I like to think that's pretty big, probably bigger than most uh, people outside of the you know sort of big tech. Um, you know, we are managing, yeah, sort of in excess of ten thousand software projects. We have thirty five thousand over thirty five thousand pipelines, CI/CD pipelines that do that. Um, and you know, we are hosting in excess of a million builds a month. Um, so again, you know, I'm sure we're not the biggest out there, but um, but you know, I, I, the, the the scale again is a very big challenge for us, and we're going to talk more about that as well. Um, and then my other very big challenge is that you know, banking is one of the most highly regulated environments uh, and industries in the, you know, in the world. Um, we everything we do is scrutinized both internally and externally. Um, you know, we have regulators, you know, these are people who, you know, I say at the top here, we're a big tech company with a banking license. You know, that license bit's very important. It's, you know, it is a privilege. It's not a right. It's something we could lose and uh, very keen not to. So uh, we keep, you know, do everything we can to keep our various regulators across all these different countries and jurisdictions with different rules uh, very happy. Um, to do that, pretty much everything we do is extensively audited. And again, this is a really big difference to unregulated industries. Um, I don't just have to deliver the right software. I have to prove that I'm doing it. Um, and uh, you know that, that's a, uh, a big part of the challenge. Um, and you know, to do that, we need to make sure we've got full traceability of everything that goes on. Um, now, we are big users of Tecton. We have been now, we started that journey about three years ago. Um, we don't exclusively use Tecton. We still have uh, sort of previous generations which are using uh, a combination. Some are using uh, Jenkins OpenShift pipelines again, but the Jenkins version. Um, and then prior to that, we have uh, you know sort of more sort of Team City based stuff. We are moving away from all of those. Tecton is very much a strategic play. Um, as I said, we've been doing that now for about three years. Um, why? Why did we do that? Um, I think there's a combination of uh, the two major things, the one in the top left and the top right here. Um, you know, the main driver was that um, you know, we are a bank. Um, we do not want to be the Solar Winds Tribute Act. Right? The, the worst thing that could conceivably happen to, uh, you know, to us would be to be in the press with a, uh, you know, a major supply chain um, uh, compromise. Right? And um, you know, Tecton, one of the most attractive features about it is that you know, pretty much everything is ephemeral. So as opposed to something like Tecton where you have, sorry, as opposed to Jenkins, where we had very long lived uh, processes, masters and, and agents, you know, in Tecton, every, every task, every you know, sort of step in your, um, in your pipeline spins up in a pod, executes and shuts down, disappears again. So that makes it very, very hard for someone to compromise it. Um, and you know, the next time it spins up, it comes up with a fresh copy of your immutable um, Docker image that uh, it runs. And um, you know, that really, uh, you know, that that makes our infosec team very happy. Um, the other thing was, I mean, I put down there was partly as a joke, but um, you know, about four or five years ago, took a close look at Google Cloud Build. Really liked it. Um, at the time, certainly, you know, the you know our bank was not willing to go into the cloud, and uh, you know they're taking a very cautious and conservative approach around that. Um, but Tecton seemed to be the you know the closest thing out there with most of the same concept. You know, industry certainly seems to be moving that way. We like very much that it's Kubernetes native. Um, you know, we we are a big Kubernetes shop. As I said, we use OpenShift extensively, and uh, so it all seems to fit pretty well. Um, right, so, and then along came Lightspeed. So what is Lightspeed, right? So Lightspeed is our internal 
CICD platform. Okay. Um, now, um, I talked before about the large scale of everything that we do um, and the need to keep that controlled and demonstrate that it's controlled, prove that it's controlled. Um, now, a tool like Tekton is, is great. Um, you know, we like it. It is very flexible, as was as described earlier. Um, but we don't want it to be too flexible. And, you know, we need to, because if we just let everybody do their own thing, when I get that person comes on and says, "Right, prove to me that everybody's doing it right," um, that becomes very difficult. Okay, so Lightspeed is a platform that we have, which sort of it's a it's a combination of um, it. Um, it sets up your pipelines for you. It controls your, you know, it's a curated platform. Right? So we actually provide a set of shared curated Tekton tasks to uh, all of our users. They don't really get to define them themselves. Um, uh, so at least not without um, a lot more oversight and governance uh, around that, uh, but they can use the tasks that we provide. Um, and we also, as we're gonna see in a minute, um, you know, have a lot of control over the pipelines themselves. The other thing that Lightspeed does, of course, is to do all of the onboarding to all of the tools in the chain. That doesn't just include Tekton, there are others, all of our security scanning tools, our, our um, Git repos, all of those things. So you can go into one place and get onboarded to the lot. Um, but ultimately, what you end up with is a joined up pipeline that from commit to production deployment, the only things that really happen through there from the commit, okay, there's a pull request. The pull request has to be merged to master. That triggers a Tekton pipeline. The Tekton pipeline will run, build it, e execute automated tests, apply scanners, etc., and then um, and then we use another tool called Harness to handle our then the you know the, the deployment side of things, which rolls it out to our various environments. But ultimately, it's just somebody pressing next. Okay, so there's no real manual intervention from after the point of a certainly no, nothing that affect can affect the code, um, but no and manual intervention after that pull request is uh, is pushed through. Um, and I put in here just for fun. So actually, we do believe very much in dog fooding. Um, Lightspeed, we build and release Lightspeed using Lightspeed, okay? Um, completely blew the minds of my auditors. They It took them quite a while to get their heads around that. Once they did, they love it because, um, you know, all of the same concepts that I'm providing about how we deliver software on behalf of all of our thousands of application developers is actually used to, develop, to deliver our own platform. Um, yeah, so the, the the magic trick that we've got here, and, and actually it was quite interesting uh, hearing about the uh, pipeline as code piece. Um, you know, we basically came to the same conclusion uh, some time ago, um, and so we found that the original construct, where you sort of define a pipeline and then you invoke the pipeline, and it spins up a, an instance of pipeline run, and that executes. But the definition of the pipeline itself was too static. We, one thing we really liked from the Jenkins world was the idea of the Jenkins file. So that control file is in your Git. It can be branched. You can have different versions of it, different flavors of it. So you can test different test new features on it, et cetera. Um, and ultimately your pipeline is based off of what was in that version of that commit of that uh, branch. Um, we do exactly that. Okay, so we have a, so we have a, uh, a service that we call our pipeline factory. What happens is that you know, when you commit, a webhook fires immediately into our pipeline factory. Now, we have a very cut down YAML file, much, much, much smaller than, than a full Tekton one. Um, it gives us all the core things that we need from our users. We then hydrate that or inflate that into a full Tekton pipeline run, and we execute the pipeline run, okay? Um, now, why do we do that? Um, there are a, a variety of reasons. Um, again, some of which I'll, I'll, uh, I'll talk about in a, in a minute. Um, but you know, one of the biggest ones is actually, you can see here, we've got a very small, like 12 lines of YAML. Actually, that Tekton is great. It's very flexible. It's very logical. It's very Kubernetes native. It does suffer slightly from the same problem that a lot of people associate with Kubernetes, which is that death by YAML, you know, you, you, it's very verbose. It's very logical, but it's very verbose. Um, we've tried to cut that down to sort of brass tacks and just the bits that we think that your average user needs. Um, and then we take care of all the ins and outs of the, um, uh, of the Tekton 
uh, YAML itself. So it's very approachable. It's very quick and easy to, to learn. Um, oh, actually, I did, I did one thing I didn't mention here, um, and I'll come back to. So, you know, there is a kind of event stream out the back of uh, of Tecton. I think it's related to the Tecton results that we were just talking about. Um, you know, we use that extensively for observability of what's going on. Again, I've got thousands and thousands of pipelines that are running. We need to know, you know, what's going on for a variety of reasons. So, observability is key. We capture a lot of that data and use that for analysis and support. Um, so what have been some of the challenges on the, the journey? I mean, there have been a number. Uh, I tried to pull out um, some of the headlines. Now, some of these are peculiar to us and the, uh, you know, this strange regulated environment that we work in, um, but some of them are not, okay? So I think the first one here, cost of entry. Now, as I said, that Tecton YAML is very, you know, it's very good, it's very flexible. It's not that easy to just get Hello World working. Um, and, uh, you know, that can be a big challenge for a lot of people. That's why we've cut this down to our kind of, uh, um, you know, domain specific language. We've, we've you know, we've, we've really paired that back. We think that that helps to address, makes it much more approachable for our teams. Um, it also gives me much more control over what ends up in that final Tecton uh, pipeline. And that's really important when it comes back to proving that everybody's following the same patterns, everyone's doing the same things. Um, and then on top of that, as I said before, we supply a, a curated list of Tecton tasks, um, and those are shared out to all of the application teams. Um, another one of the big challenges uh, here is that, uh, you know, it's again, fantastic that this thing runs on Kubernetes. Um, we love that. You know, we like that pods spin up, do their job, go away free up those resources that are available to go somewhere else. Um, and one of the great strengths and one of the big attractions was the fact that we can even size the workloads for every task in a pipeline, not just a whole pipeline, but every individual task. So something like compilation, which is more CPU intensive, gets more CPU than something which is just saving something in a database. Of course, the downside of that is you then also have to try and figure out what all the right values are. And anyone who's been using Kubernetes for any period of time will know that that sizing workloads is itself quite a challenge. You're always trying to balance. You want to give it as much resource as possible for performance, but you also want to get the most out of your uh, dollar spend. And so you want to give it as little as possible to just get it uh, what you want. And again, at the heart of this observation, observability is, is totally key. Um, security, again, we talked about this. We have to prove everything. Again, I like a lot of the things that both the OpenShift and Tecton give us out of the box. They give us the ephemeral builds. We have we can have dedicated namespaces with you know limited entitlements to get to them. Um, you know we can control the resource usage. Um, and again, we have this Tecton event stream off the back of it, which is you know really great for an audit trail. We've gone through extensive modeling with our, sorry, CISO is the city info security office. So that, that's our infosec teams. We've uh, you know, worked hand in hand with them. And actually as part of that, we are introducing Tecton chains, which uh, Gustav was just talking about uh, a few moments ago. Um, another, one thing again that we've run into is that the tasks, we have these curated tasks in its initial incarnation at least, those tasks have to be replicated to every one of the namespaces. Just that job is actually quite challenging. Um, it, I'm very interested in the resolvers that we were just talking about. I think that's going to help us a lot because we can we can centralize those and they can all just reference rather than have copies. Um, one other th one thing we have also observed here is is the um, because these these tasks are very short lived. They come, they spin up, they run. The spin up time we've noticed is longer than we want it to be. We're seeing 15, 20, 30 second delays sometimes at the start. And I think part of that might be down to uh, our, our unique environment. Um, but, um, you know, whereby you don't notice an extra 15 seconds spinning up a microservice, you do when every, when every step in your pipeline does that. So this is something that we're working through. Red Hat have been very supportive. We're, we're getting through that. But I'm just mentioning it because I think this is something which, you know, is, is worth knowing about. And then lastly, you know, again, you know, one of the things that we're very hot on is disaster recovery, continuity of business. Um, I think Tecton in its current state, really, you know, everything is sort of very cluster centric. We need the ability to move workloads between clusters very quickly and easily. In an ideal world, I could just load balance across different clusters. There's still a bit of state that's in there. I've, you know, and again, that's something I'm sure that we will work through as the product evolves. Um, so 
to summarize our experience, um, again, it's been three years. Uh, there's been uh, highs, lows, and uh, everything in between. Uh, but um, uh, you know, just I guess a few key points we picked up. We love the ephemeral builds, right? We love them from a security perspective. We love them from a capacity management perspective, as long as you get that right and you can work out how to size those things and get them uh, get them right. We, for our use case, because of the sheer scale of it, to keep things consistent and concise, we have, you know, we said we've gone with this custom DSL. Your mileage may vary. Your developers may hate that. Mine don't all love it, trust me, but, you know, it's a necessary evil. Um, and, you know, if there's one theme through all of it, um, as is the case with any kind of distributed application, microservices, Kubernetes-based stuff, just observability is absolutely everything, right? So if you're going to do this journey, then I can only recommend that you invest early uh, in, uh, well, invest heavily in observability and invest early because you will reap the benefits of that for a long time as you uh, as you go. Um, and that is the end of my presentation. Um, Harry, I will hand back to you and um, uh, hopefully I'll get a chance to uh, chat to a few people later. Thanks, Jason. Um, okay, I don't know if Harry is going to jump in, but I'm just going to mention two things. So the first thing is you may have seen Gerald in the chat. So Gerald is a red hatter. He's been answering questions that you've had. So do not be shy. Um, feel free to ask questions, and some of us will answer them. Gerald is prolific, so he will probably be the one answering most of them. Um, and then the next thing I want to talk about is that we have Ford coming up. So we have Arthur from Ford to talk about um, OpenShift lifecycle management using Argo CD, Tecton, and PAC. Uh, I'm sure you'll clarify what PAC is. Maybe it's policy as code. Um, so yeah, Arthur, um, let's get you in here. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing your presentation. Hello. Yeah, PAC would be pipelines as code, uh, the extension of Tecton. And I work over at Ford. I am one of the platform engineering leads over on our team. So we manage a fleet of OpenShift clusters. Uh, currently at about 50. We have about 2,000 unique applications running across those 50 clusters, spread across about 8,500 namespaces. And then we use both Tecton and uh, Argo CD to manage the lifecycle of these clusters. So with Argo CD, we're managing about, from the Argo CD perspective, about 75 configurable apps for each of the clusters to maintain all the configuration aspects because we do not run kubectl commands directly against our clusters under normal circumstances. But before we can talk about the clusters, we need to talk about kind of where these clusters run. So our primary hosting environment, we do bare metal, vSphere, Azure, et cetera, but our primary hosting environment is in Google. So to manage Google resources, we are also using Tecton. So we've got our pipeline set up, that way we can configure our resources in Google. Uh, and since our clusters run in Google, with the recent versions of OpenShift, we're able to use a concept called Workload Identity Federation, where we can take these Google identities and then put them directly into the clusters. So their Google identity is linked to Kubernetes service accounts. So there's no credentials required to talk to Google, similar to the STS that previously existed for Amazon, I believe. So the Tecton pipelines are managing Terraform configurations that manage the GCP projects that host the clusters that uh, operate OpenShift. So the obviously there was a bootstrap problem. Uh, the very first time we set all this up, it was done manually. But now we, that we had one cluster up and running with Tecton, it can then continue to incept more and more. So we have, uh, since Tecton Results still is in GA, we have some custom tooling put in all our pipelines that um, basically once the pipeline is done, it basically sends a information back to GitHub with a link to a bucket in Google that contains all the logs. So our primary primary mechanism for all this configuration is GitHub. So you submit a PR, pipeline kicks off, does some checks, merge it, everything else continues. And now that we have got our GCP environment configured, we need to actually incept our clusters. So with the way the OpenShift installer works is you cannot have a true declarative setup. 
you cannot have a true infrastructure as code setup. Let me clarify because uh, the installer itself is a is a complex mechanism. So we have a more declarative setup where we have an env file, which is just a set of configurations that are stored in GitHub, and then that is then passed into a custom pipeline that uh, operates on the OpenShift installer and then creates those environments. Similarly, we're able to stand up these clusters with no long-lived credentials. Everything is short-lived, and that works great. Uh, and after after the PR is run and all the checks are made and you're ensured everything is good, we have we uh, run the installation. So we have some business requirements at Ford, so we have to mutate the installer on the fly a little bit to uh, adjust for those. And after the adjustments, the pipeline itself realistically is fairly simple. You you run the OpenShift installer and then you're done. Uh, once that's done, Argo CD takes over. So it's able to then configure all other aspects of the cluster. So when we take a peek at Argo CD, we use pipelines as code with Argo CD. Uh, we use just regular Tecton to incept the cluster. And there's a couple differences there. Uh, with re regular Tecton, you get a lot more control and flexibility around how those pipelines are managed, particularly on auth, authing and control. Uh, with pipeline as code, through some future enhancements, those same functionalities will be brought over. But uh, due to certain risk aspects, we have those two differences split off. So then with Argo CD, uh, we're able to manage essentially every aspect of the cluster. So the versions of the clusters are managed through Argo CD, uh, certificates, ingress, etc. cetera. Uh, and the way we operate Argo CD is on a distributed model. So we have an instance of Argo CD running on each one of our clusters. We kind of went with that route over the centralized model for a few reasons. One being uh, we know, don't need to have uh, cluster admin tokens for every cluster because uh, when because then now we have to manage those tokens and that's a security vector that if those tokens leak, then we have to deal with. Uh, so with running distributed Argo CD, we're able to not have to worry about the uh, managing of those secrets and having that attack vector. Uh, and then also with a little bit of scalability, we're able to at least tune Argo CD on a per cluster basis to fit the size of those clusters. Um, one thing we really love about Argo CD is the plugin mechanism because the plugin mechanism allows us to enhance Argo CD with our own logic that we need. So um, we'll circle back to the logic. So how Argo CD is great, but all it really does is take YAMLs from one place and put it on the cluster. So we need to way to make sure those YAMLs that get into our GitHub to begin with are good. So we've got pipelines set up through pipeline as code. And what they do is does some basic syntax validation on those YAMLs. It, all our secrets are stored in Google Secrets Manager, and then they are referenced using the Argo CD Vault plugin. Uh, and that, but it's a binary that runs anywhere. So in our pipeline, it grabs those references from the YAMLs, replaces them, and then makes sure those the real. And then we have got other custom tasks, custom checks that run. So for example, a task that is modifying the certificates on the cluster. We want to make sure that those certificates belong to that cluster. They're not expired. Um, they're not missing the private key, or there's not a part of the chain isn't missing. Um, and then we also run kubeform, kube conform against our YAMLs, which is running against the Kubernetes specifications for those CRDs. Not all the CRDs, such as the Tecon CRDs, have uh, kube spec, uh, proper Kubernetes spec specifications, but hopefully in due time, the rest of those CRDs will catch up and we can then validate those also with kube conform. And then with those custom plugins, we're able to then have Argo CD also run the same tests that our pipelines do. So because Argo CD is pulling the secrets directly from Secrets Manager to apply to our clusters, we need to make sure that if for some reason the secret inside Google Secrets Manager was changed, that 
that does not get applied to the cluster if it's invalid for whatever reason. So we've got custom plugins we wrote to essentially run the same checks and then Argo, stop Argo CD from continuing in those scenarios. And similarly, you also got a bootstrap problem, particularly with IPI installs, because the some of the components have randomized names. So there's some additional logic being done inside Argo CD to pull those randomized values at runtime and swap them in. So then here's kind of how we've structured how we use Argo CD. So we've got a similar to, we use customize, first of all, to actually manage all our YAMLs. We use Helm in a few places where customize doesn't make sense, but for the most part, we're using customize. So we've got our base, which contains everything that a particular application would need. And then, so for example, on the right, this is a screenshot of configuring Argo CD on one of our clusters. So we've got the base contains the basic information that's required for all clusters. Then we go into our components section. So we've got all our apps listed under components. Uh, you could put that under base realistically, but we have them split under components. And then we've got all our repos for all our GitHub repos listed there. And then, then we kind of take it a little step further. So we got different versions of Argo CD version control, and these are all M based. So for 192, we've got all the version configurations for 192, and then all of the YAMLs associated with that. In particular, with 192 to 110, there was a CRD change. So in this case, it actually was nice to have. So in 1.10.0, there are basically a duplicated version of all of the configurations in 192, but with the updated um, CRD configurations. And then each one of our clusters get pointed to a particular version. And then we've got our test file as well which basically just runs, in Argo CD's case, just a build and a secrets check. So we talked about the bootstrap problem. Uh, the issue is can't some of the overlays require a field that do not exist before the cluster is built. So Argo CD will, additional RBAC has been granted to those components to pull that information from the cluster. Uh, another key problem is the cluster UUID, which is also randomized, but also not immutable. So what we have to do, or if you didn't know, it is not immutable in the cluster UUID. So you could delete your cluster's unique identifier and it'd be gone. So we make a backup of that just in case. And that way we can apply that dynamically without having to worry about it being overwritten. And it can be overwritten because the location that that UID is actually stored is in the uh, cluster version, which we also then mutate from GitHub because that's how we update the clusters. And another component of OpenShift, which is not really GitOps friendly, is the uh, config map for the monitoring stack because it's a config map, not a CRD. And you can't run customized commands against it, for example. Or if you have multiple controllers mutating the same config map, such as open cluster management, then you end up in a kind of weird scenario where it's not following traditional Kubernetes practices and it's just a YAML and a config map anyways. So we so we wrote some custom tooling to effectively clone that config map into a CRD and all the operator does is turn that CRD into a config map. So then we mutate the CRD and we can control all of that through Git and then the operator just handles a conversion to a config map in that sense. And that's kind of what we do for a platform perspective for configuring all of this. And what we're moving towards is managing our tenant namespaces. Uh, previously, we had a API that would write directly to the clusters, the namespace, resource quotas, et cetera. But we're also moving that towards Git. So what we're doing there is it's a very similar pipeline towards this that we do for the platform with a few additional checks with like policy enforcement. So it's a Git repo. All our application teams have their namespaces listed in there. And then they're able to make pull requests to make changes to their namespaces. And then we use the policy enforcement to make sure that any changes they're making are fine changes. So then right at the PR stage, that will get either accepted or denied. And then we'll take a look, approve it, and merge it as needed. So then we're using that to configure all of our namespaces and how we onboard end users to the clusters. 
And then kind of what we're looking forward to in the future of OpenShift is uh, since we operate in GCP, um, we currently operate in all our clusters in a single project, but with some of the new enhancements coming, we're able to now finally split that off all into each of their own projects per cluster. And from the Argo CD side, we're hoping to start offering Argo CD as a service to our tenants so they can deploy their own applications with uh, Argo CD. So that, that would be an interesting endeavor to do at scale. And that would be everything that I have. All right. Thanks, Arthur. Uh, that's pretty good. There's tons of questions in the chat. I was just monitoring. Um, some of them are going towards Jason, but I'm guessing they're going to come in for you too in a moment. Um, <laughs> it's just, it's been pretty busy. So that's great. I think people are getting a lot of value out of this and, and, and thanks for your presentation. Carlos, Andrew, welcome. And we're looking forward to hearing about uh, your testing in the upstream with Argo CD. See. Can you hear us well? Hello. Loud and clear, loud and Sounds clear. Sounds great. Okay, we both? Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, let's get started. Um, so we are here from AWS. Uh, my name is Carlos Santana. I'm a senior specialist solutions architect um, with Kubernetes, anything Kubernetes on AWS. Um, uh, go ahead, Andrew. Yeah, uh, my name is Andrew Lee. I'm a senior prototyping architect with uh, AWS and Strategics. Um, yeah. And we're here to present about uh, Argo CD scalability testing in the upstream. So I'm going to advance. And here's our agenda. So our agenda is, um, you know, what is Argo CD? I think everyone knows uh, what Argo CD is. And but why should we care? Uh, and then we have motivate motivations and goals for the scalability sig that uh, that we started uh, or co-started. And then our approach to scalability testing what we learned from the scalability testing, and then conclusions and future activities. So now I'll throw it over to Carlos. OK, so um, to talk a little bit about Argo CD, and uh, the last presentation talk about what was Argo CD, but it's a uh, CNCF uh, graduated project, uh, including Argo. Argo has many projects, like Argo workflows, Argo events, Argo rollouts, Argo CD. Uh, today we're focusing more on Argo CD, and um, one of the reasons that me and Andrew and others in AWS have joined the open source community in Argo CD is because we're working with a lot of end users that are leveraging Argo CD and encountering uh, either issues or lack of documentation, or they have a lot of questions about how to best how to find best practice to use Argo CD. And some of the end users that we have worked with are large organizations that are currently adopting Argo CD for various reasons, uh, from using it for the native way of doing Argo CD RBAC with multi-cluster environments where they have one management cluster and have that different spoke clusters in, in, in Kubernetes, to the ability to have that GUI. I think everybody is very familiar with the Argo CD UIs. They fall in love because as they get started in, in the Kubernetes um, config management, having a visual representation of what's deployed in the cluster is very appealing. So either for multiple reasons, large organizations are adopting Argo CD. So we wanted to get involved in the community to see how we can help those end users take advantage of Argo CD and, and build a community around it. Uh, another uh, uh, aspect of it is Argo CD is becoming the multi-cluster, multi-tenant. Um, you saw in the last, uh, last presentation talking about teams and projects and namespaces, it's becoming a multi, multi-cluster, multi-tenant solutions to build internal developer platforms, um, um, IDPs. And if you want to learn more about how, how Argo CD and Argo workflow is being used in, in IDPs, you can check a project called Canoe, C-N-O-E.io. It's a recent effort by uh, a group of these large organizations of end users coming together and selecting a set of technology of stacks to build IDPs. So Argo CD and Argo workflow is one of those main components. Other ones are like Backstage and other CNCF projects. So they're coming together. So if you want to join that that other community, you're you're welcome to. So that's why we are involved with, with Argo CD in terms of like, how do we push its boundary to cover use cases in the enterprise where like we're seeing more adoption 
and customer um, and end users are asking for help in terms of resiliency, observability, security on using Argo CD properly with Kubernetes. Um, next slide. And talking about motivations and goals, um, I started asking in the Argo CD community. I was a heavy user uh, of Argo CD. I was encountering myself problems of finding good documentation or good patterns or good examples on how to do um, scalability testing um, because we wanted to see, observe, and do testing uh, on these large environments, mostly that hub and spoke environment where you have it's a small number of Argo CD controllers managing a large set of applications. Um, so we wanted to find the, the bottlenecks and, and prototype, like that's why Andrew is involved, prototype what are the different set of configurations from a large number of clusters to a large number of applications. Does, does Argo CD can scale? And in terms of scaling Kubernetes controllers is something that scales differently from your stateless application. And with that, the, the SIG, uh, we, we reached out to the community and the, the community was very accepted to our proposal to get together between um, different companies, including Red Hat, Acuity, and other uh, main maintainers at Intuit, CoFresh. All of them are very interested in solving this and providing assets to the community in terms of blogs, documentation, tooling for for enterprise to do their own testing inside their Kubernetes environments uh, to, to get those um, observability uh, metrics and then uh, act on them and how to tune them. So we, we recently published a, a blog um, blog post and we're working on a second one and also working on enhancing the, the performance. But the idea is to provide kind of that operator uh, manual uh, information for and users and admins of these clusters. Like uh, we have at Kubernetes admins, and these admins actually need help with this type of tooling. Um, and the last thing that uh, uh, is to introduce, we started with the benchmark, just like understanding what are the problems, what, how far can we get with the tune, tuning the parameters. And Andrew is going to cover like what parameters to tune based on which. Um, use case, and then what are the trade-offs of this tuning? When you come into tuning for performance, you're doing a trade-off. So Andrew is going to talk about that and then how we intend to contribute to solve these uh, bottlenecks. Next. So Andrew, take over. Yeah, so um, our approach to scalability testing uh, is we st stood up an environment um, where we had a mono repo Git repo. Uh, we st stood up Argo CD. And they're actually all running on uh, Amazon EKS. So we developed uh, a test environment with over 10,000 applications and 97 uh, EKS clusters. Uh, we we actually viewed uh, observability through key metrics in Grafana. So there is actually a dashboard that's provided by the community uh, in Argo CD that has all the key metrics that you need to kind of look into what is going on in Argo CD. Uh, the other thing that we wanted to make sure that we document and test is all the key scalability parameters. Um, I know when I started working on uh, our scalability testing was uh, there was not a lot of uh, information or documentation on these parameters that you can tune. Uh, a lot of the information would either be buried in the documentation or I would have to go through GitHub issues and find uh, some of these parameters. So putting them all in one place, uh, it's actually in the blog post, but also updating the documentation with Argo CD uh, is one of the goals that we want to have from the scalability testing. So let's move on. So uh, some of the key metrics that we have, uh, as mentioned before, there's a Grafana dashboard that's provided by the the um, community provided in Argo in the Argo project GitHub. Uh, you can find that there. And that's what I use generally for looking in and performing the scalability testing. So making changes to uh, Argo CD parameters and then running a sync test and then viewing uh, the, the performance through the Grafana dashboard. So the key metrics that we use for our scalability testing was sync time. So sync time is actually just uh, when we have 10,000 uh, applications, they're all connected to one Git repo. Uh, we make a change to that Git repo. And because we have, um, I think it's auto sync on, uh, Argo CD will see that there's a change in the upstream Git repo. 
and then just push all those changes down into uh, the target clusters. So that's kind of like uh, how we were able to do sync tests. And then we would view from the sync status when we have out of sync um, applications to when we don't have any more out of sync applications. So that's kind of like where we would determine our sync time. Uh, work queue depth, we actually use work queue depth to see there's actually two queues in Argo CD uh, that is for uh, kind of like the main uh, operations that it's doing. So there's a status um, and a operation uh, operations. So what, what the status, op, uh, status queue does is that the status is actually checking uh, first the upstream Git repo and also uh, reconciling that with the downstream applications that are uh, deployed to your clusters. And then operations, uh, the operation processing queue is actually where uh, if there's any changes that need to be made to the downstream um, uh, clusters, the operations queue is where all these operations would be occurring. Uh, so making the changes to the um, to, to the downstream uh, resources. Uh, the last thing that we actually were viewing was the CPU usage. Um, and so what we found was that Argo CD uh, was uh, at least the app controller is more CPU bound. Um, and well, we didn't really do any, uh, see any memory uh, usage issues that when we were doing our scalability testing, uh, but there has been talk in the community about uh, memory usage being uh, really high with Argo CD. And so in our next uh, round of testing and the next blog post, we will post uh, memory usage uh, st statistics. So what, what did we learn from the scalability testing is, um, so one of the first things that we uh, actually looked at was the reconciliation timeout. So um, there was actually a really great blog post by uh, IBM earlier in the, before we started the scalability, scalability testing and uh, they keyed in on this reconciliation timeout. And so what is the reconciliation timeout? It's actually the interval at which the status processors would be checking the get um, repo and reconciling that with the downstream clusters. So if you set this too high, uh, what happens is that you would be uh, going and checking the Git repo more often and then trying to reconcile that with the downstream uh, environment. And then you would basically get into a, a, a constant state of this reconciliation, uh, which can cause some problems like CPU usage would be uh, higher than it needs to be. Uh, and what it does, how it affects the sync times, it doesn't affect the sync times because this is more on um, just basically on the reconciliation performance and what to watch for, which is what I mentioned before, which is it could cause overlapping status intervals. And what I mean by that is if we go back a slide, um, you would see the yellow graph here uh, is actually the reconciliation queue. It would basically be pinned at 10,000 at all times because the reconciliation timeout is too aggressive. So we do uh, suggest to users that they check their reconciliation timeout if they're seeing something where their reconciliation timeout was is at the maximum at all times, then they should check this out. Uh, the next thing that we want to look at is the status and operation processors. So there's actually a, a parameter that you can set for each status processors or operation process. And what this determines is actually the number of concurrent uh, operations that can be run for either the status or operation processor. Uh, it determines the parallelism of the app controller. Uh, what we found was that it didn't have any effect on our sync times uh, during scalability testing. And uh, what we wanted to do was it, it probably requires further investigation. Uh, my hunch is that it had to do with the type of applications that we're using. We're actually just using applications that are very simple, uh, two kilobyte config maps. So in that way, it could be that the, uh, in, we're never able to load up the app controller to cause um, uh, making these settings actually uh, actually make an effect on our sync time. So uh, I think we need to look at this in uh, part two of our uh, scalability testing, and I do I will uh, go over it there. Uh, and then QPS and client QPS. Now what we found was that there's a um, you know a, a client go um, Kubernetes uh, client that is making all these calls to both um, the Argo CD cluster itself and also to the downstream cluster. And uh, it, it, it actually was what regulates how many uh, Kubernetes API calls you can, you can make. 
And changing these actually had the greatest effect um, if we don't go into sharding. So if we still have only one application controller. We were able to, you know, changing these these settings, these QPS and client QPS, we were able to change uh, decrease sync times from 41 minutes all the way down to 12 minutes. So it, it actually had a big effect on it. Um, th these type of settings is actually, I don't think it's in the documentation yet, um, but if you kind of go through the GitHub issues, you can see them talking about it uh, slightly. Now, what could happen if you change the QPS or client QPS settings? Um, you could overload your uh, Kubernetes control plane API. And that's why um, you know these settings are important. Um, let's say you can't shard your uh, Argo CD um, deployment out to different clusters because it's sharding by cluster, uh, then you would want to change this setting, but you need to monitor your Kubernetes control plane API. And then the last setting that we kind of played around was played around with is uh, our controller sharding. So uh, what this does, is it takes the application controller uh, and actually shards um, the controller by clusters. So you would have, um, let's just say you have five shards. Each of those shards would be managing a subset of all the clusters that you have um, that you're managing in Argo CD. And from changing this setting by actually sharding, we, we were able to decrease sync times from 41 minutes down to eight minutes. So sharding, sharding uh, the Argo CD application controller had a big effect on performance. Uh, but what, what it requires is that you distribute the apps across clusters. And we're actually going to go into, um, you know, in the next round of testing, we're going to go into how those sharding algorithms um, actually work. Uh, there's actually some sharding algorithms that determine how many clusters go to each shard. Uh, and we can actually see some imbalance if that happens also. So that's kind of like one of the drawbacks of sharding. So our con conclusions and future activities. Um, so what we found was that sharding is the key component of scaling Argo CD. Um, and so if you're not, um, if you're, if it kind of forces you to have more clusters if you have a lot of applications. So if you have 10,000 applications, you don't want to have these 10,000 applications going to one cluster because then you can't take advantage of sharding. So it kind of forces you, if you're using Argo CD, if to, to kind of split up all your applications and going down, uh, being sent to multiple uh, clusters. And so that you're able to take advantage of the sharding uh, features of Argo CD. And what we found was um, in the beginning, the sharding algorithm, there was only a single sharding algorithm called, it's called, it now called legacy. Um, it, what it did was it actually did not have perfect balance across the shards. So what we were seeing from the, the legacy uh, sharding, sharding algorithm was that uh, some shards would be uh, handling way more shards than another shard, way more clusters than another shard. And that would cause higher CPU usage on uh, one particular uh, Argo CD application controller shard and uh, causing imbalance. Uh, and I know Red Hat has introduced a new uh, sharding algorithm, kind of like a framework, so that other people can contribute their own sharding algorithms. And they also included with that change, they included a round robin uh, sharding algorithm. And through testing I've done, uh, the round robin uh, is able to keep balance between plus or minus one cluster. So ba basically, uh, the number of clusters per shard is equal across all the different shards. Uh, and that helps with um, with scalability. The only issue with uh, the current sharding algorithms that we have today and the sharding method is that it only shards by a cluster and it doesn't know about the number of applications you have in those clusters. So in, in that way, if you have a cluster with uh, 10,000 apps and you have another cluster with 1,000 apps, uh, the sharding algorithm would just kind of give it each of them to one um, in, into one uh, shard and you can have imbalance that way. And so kind of like what we're looking at is we're looking at introducing new sharding algorithms, one that uh, is going to shard by the number of apps. Um, so it kind of takes into account the number of applications on each cluster. And so say you have a thousand apps on one cluster, it would go to a shard and then every, it would, every other shard, uh, every other cluster that comes in would be sent to uh, shards with less apps. So that's kind of taking the apps into um, 
taking the taking the apps into uh, account when you're making these sharding decisions. Uh, the other thing that we want to do is work with uh, Red Hat on exploring uh, re-architecturing the app controller, because as currently the application controller uh, has to be sharded by um, clusters. But if, if possible, if we're able to separate that from uh, instead of uh, sharding by clusters, but we actually shard by apps uh, natively, then I think we can actually get around uh, some of the issues that we're having with sharding and scalability. And then I'll turn that over to Carlos. Yeah. So uh, thank you for your time. And and this is a, the call to action to to the community. Um, Argo CD is uh, like I said, it's a CNCF project. It's an it's a open source project. So uh, if you you contribute to CNCF, you get the benefits of uh, you know joining a large community of different practitioners. Um, we have a SIG scalability interest group. It went through the proposal process of the Argo project. So we submitted the, the proposal between different um, uh, entities, organizations, and it got accepted. We meet at the second and the fourth Wednesday of the month. Um, there's an agenda doc that if you want to go back of what, what are the issues, uh, what are the topics that we're discussing, uh, you, can, you can access that. We have a, a CNCF Slack. Um, there's multiple I, I encourage you to join uh, uh, the uh, that's, that's a typo there it's Argo seek scalability but there's also Argo CD um, and others Argo CD uh, slack uh, channels and you can join them and ask questions and also one of the things that I have said I've gained from joining slack is like learning what end users are doing so uh, for example last week somebody was asking help because uh, she had, 10 clusters, but it had 10,000 apps. <laughs> so it was uh, even like um, uh, problems with scalability and, and that's where you can find people to help you with the, your problem you can help others. Um, there's the the other links to our, the GitHub repo, we ha which have an, a, an example and, and a pull request um, on the benchmark tooling that our, our Andrew developed uh, from the CLI to be to easily take these benchmarks and run them in your um, uh, Argo CD environments with Kubernetes. So uh, I want to thank the Red Hat for opportunity to let the upstream uh, team here to join and um, uh, uh, and presenting our, our findings in benchmarks. So uh, if you want to join, um, go ahead and join in Slack or join our meetings. Yep, thank you, Red Hat and everyone. Fantastic. Our host coming back. Okay, Harriet. Yes. Hello. Thank you so much. Um, I will grab my other hosts as well. And if everyone could remember to unmute this time, that would be lovely. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much to all of our presenters. This has been absolutely fantastic.